Hey everybody, welcome to Training with Casey. This is Casey, your host, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Julie Alexander. And Julie's going to take us through some of the important relationships with um, hormones and hormone interactions with our pets. So Julie, I know you just got out of a Christmas party, so you're kind of segueing to something kind of serious. So uh, say hi and, and welcome. And hey, um, folks. So um, hormones are so incredibly powerful and the interactions that go back and forth with them, like Casey, we were just talking about the axis, the HPA, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis, these three glands go back and forth to regulate things. And a problem with one of them can wind up interfering with the other two. Mm. One common one with creating adrenal problems is something going on with the pituitary. If a tumor or a cyst forms on the pituitary, the pressure that it puts on it will wind up affecting adrenal function. Sometimes it'll cause hypo, and it, what is that? Is that I believe that's Cushing's. I'm more familiar. Uh, I'm sorry. Hypo would be uh, getting into Addison's or adrenal insufficiency, okay. and that can have various degrees of uh, what'll happen with it. Um, and then I think it's Cushing's is when you get hyper, yeah, and start producing too much. And it's not just, uh, of course, cortisol. It can start creating problems with adrenaline. Sometimes if you're low in cortisol, the body tries to substitute adrenaline. That's not fun. Uh, and they can create swings in too much energy, not enough energy. Uh, it can create problems with um, cognition mood. I, it creates problems with uh, controlling glucose, I, blood pressure. How can an animal let you know? There, are, I mean, there are some physical signs that you can look for. You can do some tests, but how can an animal start to tell you when they're yeah. getting discomfort with some it, of this? This is a big deal because I reversed my diabetes. So I was diagnosed last uh, January, February. And by July, I had blood sugars down to the 100 range average. And then suddenly in the last month, it's been up to 150. But the biggest change is stress level. And, and if your cortisol goes up, that affects glucose regulation. And that's where a lot of things with high cortisol, people start getting weight gain and things like belly fat. Yeah. And yeah. So the stress levels will go up. Um, how often do animals try to hide some stress? Yeah. And uh, to, well, how and can we for my case, I don't necessarily feel much of a difference. Like sometimes I get a mild headache. Mm hmm. But for an animal, they might be more aware of it, but are we going to be aware of it if we're just watching them? Yes. Yeah. You know, are we going to pick up on these really subtle changes? And if they haven't been specifically taught, like we know dogs can alert for humans for low and high bl um, blood sugar, could they learn to monitor themselves? And would that be good or not? I don't know. And to be able to yeah, to find out how can the animal do it? How can we detect if there is a behavior or a cognitive issue? Uh, and it's not that just that the animal is you know being stupid or they're being a jerk. It's because of what's going on internally with them uh, is going to create uh, problems. Um, how much do the sex hormones affect behavior? We talked about just a minute ago about a false pregnancy. 
uh, and bitches having a false pregnancy. And the ones that I've seen that go through it become absolutely neurotic. I mean, they're crazier than any bitch I've ever seen that actually really was pregnant and had puppies. Uh, they'll go hide in a little den that they make for themselves for months, um, collecting little toys. Uh, what happens with free martin cattle? Mm. So they're exposed to certain hormonal things during pregnancy from the male twin. Uh, they're sterile. Yeah, they have explain, uh, masculine behaviors. Because a lot of people aren't going to know what that term is. Okay. So a free martin is when a cow has twins, one heifer and one bull calf. And the female the calf, the heifer calf, is always sterile always exhibits some degree of male behaviors. They'll do a lot of mounting of other cows. They'll becoming more aggressive and they're acting more like a bull. Uh, so this is just, you know, shots of hormones at certain points during the pregnancy from the male twin. Yeah. So that's having physical and behavioral aspects going on with it. We also have so many chemicals going on in our environment right now that are affecting things like thyroid, um, sex hormones, um, interfering with a lot of things. How can we try to find out what's going on, what might be creating a behavioral issue that's going on in some way so that we can balance it so that they can behave and learn yeah. the best they can. Thyroid, uh, low thyroid is going to make you sluggish. Cognition slows down. Uh, mood tends to become very low, sometimes fearful. Um, I'm not as familiar with hyper. That's more common in cats than in dogs. Uh, but that'll wind up le leading to weight loss. Uh, it can also lead to hair loss. Sometimes they'll wind up becoming a little bit more active, but it's very draining on their body. Eyes will uh, kind of pop out a little bit. Pop out. Yeah. <clears throat> so to be aware of these things, how can we detect them very early? Uh, and again, you know, nine, you know, making sure that the animal is uh, not being limited by something biological that's going on. And when you talk about the contaminants in the environment, a lot of the contaminants are, um, I, all of a sudden I can't think of the word, but they mimic the sex hormones. Mm -hmm. They're estrogenizing or something, you know, whichever way they go. And so, for example, in the water, there's so much progesterone from women birth taking birth control pills that it has or they believe that this is the reason that entire populations of fish in the Chesapeake Bay have become only female. So it, the last uh, time I that. checked, it was lamprey. And also they were thinking that the eel and fish are a, just a different kind of critter because some of them can change sex back and forth. Yes. Mm -hmm. depending on certain environmental factors, some of them will go from male to female and not revert back again, or maybe even vice versa. So they don't know if this spells extinction for these animals or if they're going to be resilient enough to go back and forth or if they'll change where they go. You know, it's a big unknown, but that is how severe the effect of hormones is. And what, it, oh, glyphosate. Glyphosate is estrogenizing and they've had a spate of human children in areas where the glyphosate levels are high who are being uh, born with malformed sexual organs mm -hmm. as a result of it. And it, I mean, it's really serious. We've got to get on it as a race or as a species. I remember hearing about, I'm not sure if it was the glyphosate um, 
or some combination of herbicide and insecticide, but the wives of men who were working in various pesticide things, in, particularly in rural areas where they were doing a lot of it, were getting exposed secondhand and their boy children had a high frequency of having a malformed penis. The aretha was coming out someplace uh, on, on the shaft that it that shouldn't comes be. out the top. Yep, that's exactly what I was referring to. And also wives of farmers have a higher rate of cancer from these uh, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides that farmer takes off his coverall. And, and she does the washing. Yeah, the wife does the washing and she picks them up, hugs them to her to throw them in the washer and it gets the exposure. Yes. So this secondhand exposure, yes, we have to deal with some of this. We have to be able to realize some of the behavioral problems. There was some combination of fertilizer, herbicide, and pesticide that I heard about oh, years ago. Oh, yeah. I remember you telling me that. Something like nitrate, and there were three things. And, yeah, and yeah, individually. Pesticides individually, yeah, they weren't a problem. But the combination of them was leading to uh, issues in the children being born with thyroid issues, sometimes adrenal issues, high rate of ADD. Um, and so you were coming up with a lot of behavioral and cognitive problems with it. We uh, and to think of something really interesting like that and not be able to remember the details at this moment. We'll have to come back and, and tell people what that is, because that's really. So the things can be, it's these combinations. We have so many of these chemicals out there uh, and sometimes the various different hormonal issues will wax and wane depending on stress, yeah. uh, environmental exposure to some of the different chemicals, sometimes a change in diet with thyroid issues, uh, hypothyroid, there's certain things that you don't want to eat a lot of. You don't want to eat a lot of soy products. You don't want to eat a whole lot of the brassicas. Oh, really? They can wind up, they can wind up slowing down the thyroid even more. Uh, so sometimes dietary changes, seasonal changes. Uh, I've heard of some people who are hypothyroid that are always, they have to cut back on their medication during the summer. They can start to recognize that they're showing symptoms of hyper. Pulse rate goes up. They feel a little wired. But how can an animal tell that? Or how can how an can animal tell, tell you that? Yeah. So do you wind up having to be able to do things like going, okay, during the summer, maybe they're going to, you know, are they just getting a little bit more wired? Um, do you start taking their pulse rate and trying to monitor, could it be getting too high by taking their pulse rate? So that you're not having to take them in and get a you know a blood test uh, once a month to keep monitoring it, uh, and, or the converse if the if it seems optimal range during the summer, uh, and they slow down during the winter, do you need to bump it up a little bit more? Do you need to start checking to see are they hanging out near the heater more than usual, or is the hair getting thinner? How can we try to stay above it when we, you know, or do we have to keep trying to take their temperature, stick a thermometer up their butt, you know, every day in the morning to see what yeah, they're resting in other words, we need to be aware first and then to come up with a reasonable way to monitor. Yes. Uh, and uh, to be able to kind of monitor and, and notice how much is this creating any behavioral issues either way, um, or is it going to be showing kind of a matter of comfort? Are they simply more relaxed? Uh, but to make sure that we're not just jumping to the conclusion that they're being a butthead when it's things that are going on that they literally can't control. Well, uh, and or also, uh, it's so complex. My sister's a scientist, and we've been really working on trying to understand how to eat the best possibly and so on and so forth. And it, it's not only complex, but it changes. Yes. So again, my uh, study of one 
So I get this diabetes um, diagnosis and I was really disappointed because I had been losing weight consistently by eating, you know, uh, fasting and keto diet. But during this time, that's when my blood sugar shot up and I'm doing exactly what they tell you is most likely to solve, you know, I'm losing the weight and I'm fasting and that's supposed to solve those problems. And really nobody could give me any help on that. Nobody that I talked to. So eventually I find out about the cortisol. Well, then I was just thinking the other day, wait a minute, when I was in my mid twenties and started working at the national zoo, I only ate one meal a day and it was mm -hmm. a healthy meal and no snacks. And I was extremely fit and everything was great. I was tiny and all of a sudden in the month before we opened the, my area at the zoo, you know, for the public, I gained 15 pounds in one month and nothing had changed. Like I ate with, I uh, rented a room for my boss's family and, you know, his wife served up the dinner and I had one serving of everything. And that was the end of that. I didn't even make any choices of what I ate. It was just good, healthy food. And then sometime not long after that, I became severely hypoglycemic. So exactly the same set of conditions that they're saying, mm -hmm. oh, this is optimal, resulted in diabetes, resulted in weight gain, and resulted in hypoglycemia. So there's obviously, or not obviously, but there must be other very important aspects. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that's similar, when I was also at National Zoo, of course, I was exposed to lots of different animal, you know, dander and saliva and all that kind of thing. And also a lot of molds and so forth. We were constantly moving shavings and compost and, and other, yeah and there's all of the mold pollen that could be yeah. getting kicked up and i often would kind of lose my voice mm -hmm. and i was very very uh reactive to cats so i stayed with a friend who had six wonderful cats and every night at 2 30 in the morning I would lose my ability to breathe. I would wake up. I was in a an asthmatic attack and didn't even realize it. And that's a time of night when the cortisol tends to drop. Interesting. So then later on, I owned cats and mm -hmm. had no problems at all. But I didn't have this other pressure from yes. the stress of the zoo job and the stress from the huge amounts of animal, uh, you know, antigens. And our cortisol levels can sort of be learned, be trained and adjust with the body. Like an extreme athlete might be producing 20, 30 times the amount of cortisol throughout the day that uh, an average you know, normal fitness person would be, but their body's using it up. Oh, okay. So, it, so their body is consuming them and they're fine and they're healthy. So how does one use up cortisol? Um, going through all of the physical exercise. Oh, so okay. because it's involved in glucose regulation, blood pressure regulation, it's being consumed, it's being metabolized normally. So for them, this is their normal level. Well, what happens to them if they suddenly stop? Mm. They have an injury. Their body's saying, hey, boss, okay, we should still be pumping all of this out. Wow. So now they're that getting, can definitely well, happen to an athletic animal that suddenly. That suddenly, I mean, I, I've heard of, you know, racehorses coming off the track at the end of the season. You know, how can they take them and wind them down? If you just toss them a paddock, not good. 
Can you toss them in a pasture with a bunch of other ones where they can chase each other around and burn it off? But to be able to take them off at the end of the season, how do you kind of wind them back down? Uh, or the flip side is you've got somebody who's normally fit and then suddenly you're trying to put them into a really high pressure, you know, intensive training. Their body can't keep up with the production. It has to ramp up the ability to turn out that, that much. So if they're going to go into a hypo state, even though if you were testing their cortisol levels, you'd be saying that's perfectly normal. It should be fine. But yeah. their body's saying, hey, you know, this isn't making it. So you were having you had adjusted to certain levels of things, then you throw in a new factor, like exposure to the allergens in the cats, uh, and suddenly it's more than your body can handle. Yeah. And also because cortisol is involved in mast cell regulation, mm. uh, if you start getting mast cell issues because of this, and that can be things you know like the mold and the, the other things like this can trigger them. Um, and... Then, so at that time of night, your cortisol is low. You're exposed to all of this stuff. There may not be that much fresh air moving through. And you're getting set up for something that's going to hit you in the middle of the night. Yeah. Yeah, because it was pretty much like clockwork. And also, I have learned that people whose cortisol isn't on target have a tendency to not want to go to sleep till then. Mm -hmm. and um you know their cortisol spikes at the wrong time of the day yeah yeah um and another odd thing that can happen with cortisol under enough stress post-traumatic stress can wind up having an epigenetic effect directly on the dna wow causing a paradoxical effect that under certain types of stress the cortisol will drop the problem with that and so that can wind up creating a, a state that just goes into freeze mode it, it just locked up frozen unable to do much of anything the other thing that can happen with it is the body again will try to substitute adrenaline i and substitute adrenaline and then there can be another strange interaction where at times a certain amount of adrenaline is needed to turn off a spike in cortisol. But if too much of the cortisol has been turned, uh, if the adrenals turn out all their energy into producing cortisol because the adrenals are rather weak, doesn't have enough of the raw materials left over to produce enough of the adrenaline to turn it off. So this whole interplay with keeping the hormones and the glands balanced, realizing that if we're going to start making changes to an animal's environment, their training schedule, uh, you have to be careful taking them up, try to balance, make sure they get enough downtime, enough rest, how much it also depends what time of the day. Is it that do they, is it an animal that would normally kind of nap during the day? Um, do they get enough sleep at night? Do they get enough chance to rest? Uh, finding out, you know, how can we fit it in with their natural schedule, but also break it up enough so that they can realize that, okay, at times I'm going to have to stay up later than normal, or I don't get my afternoon nap. Get a little bit of resilience. Uh, but to, to be able to break it up and push them a little harder and then at times give them different breaks. Be careful about bringing them up in training to more and more intensity, whether it's mental intensity, physical intensity, and then also bring them down. If you've got an animal that's used to being uh, really busy, you know, doing different types of things, and then it, and maybe they've been hunting all season or you get a herding dog that's been herding uh you know for quite a while what happens if you just take them off and they're going i'm bored i'm really really bored i'm used to having all of this stuff to do i'm really really bored you expect me to just wind down and take a nap now they're going, no i'm bored 
their body needs to be able to start down regulating from that intense mental exercise. You know, do you have this issue? Like I often feel like I need to turn on information stuff in the background. Oh yes. So like if I'm, you know how we like to listen to podcasts and audio books when we're working out or doing housework. It's more than I like it. If I don't have something to keep my mind somewhat occupied, I feel uncomfortable in my own skin. And your mind will find some way to entertain you or, or to get like those dopamine hits. What are two ways that are pretty much guaranteed to give you a rush? Fear and anger. Mm. Where does drama come? How many people create drama because they're bored? Oh, now that's a really good point. That's a really so good they're, point. They're really, they're bored. Um, and if you, if you can find some way to channel and give that mental outlet, uh, my roommate's dog has got a pretty mixed breed we got from a shelter. Seems to have a pretty good shot of terrier in him. And when he gets bored, and my dog is done saying, hey, you know, okay, I've, I've had enough routing with you for a while. He's very creative at finding ways to entertain himself. Yeah. Dragging the water bowl out the dog door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, thank you. <laughs> you, know, you know it's like why you know, find other things like why do you want to take that empty cardboard box out the dog door uh so finding the ways of entertaining himself uh when he hasn't had enough mental stimulation but if he has a chance to get out for several walks best of all is if he can go for a good long car ride and get all of the smells and if we run into a store and he, he, the dogs get to hang out in the car and you know bark at people going by but it's the smells <laughs> the odors it's the sounds so it's all of the sensory stimulation yeah and it's burning up um you know all of this energy it's giving them the endorphins it's giving them some of the dopamine it's using up some of the noradrenaline and the adrenaline uh and it calms them down it also has to be the right type of stimulation. Sometimes if you take them into something that's too high intensity, they'll get so jazzed, they can't come down. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's probably more complex. Since then, about 20 years ago, I heard a description saying that serotonin is like the brakes on a car. Noradrenaline is like the gas. Dopamine is sort of like the steering wheel. But what happens when, if you get kids that are playing on a playground, they're having a really good time. Suddenly they get tired. Yeah. Well, the serotonin is burning out. The dopamine is burning out. But they still want to have fun. And they think the answer is to keep pressing on the gas pedal. Yeah. So you've got the noradrenaline and the adrenaline pumping up and the brakes and the steering are gone. So you yeah. wind up. There's a fine line between fun, a fear, and a fight. Well, and they crash. I mean, that's a good analogy because yes. they literally crash. So you'll have a child that's hyper delighted. They're running around from side to side, squealing with rapture. And all of a sudden, they're sobbing. Yes. And it's like they can't handle those extreme states and yeah that takes us back to how do we prepare animals for this because you and I are talking about how can we support our animals and yet they're actually their first line of support you know when they learn the effect of dopamine on their system and they learn to choose otherwise they're the first ones to know that there's a problem. But let's go back to what you were saying. I made a few notes, but if we were going to give people something helpful to apply this information practically, 
I wrote down that maybe, so I'm running this past you to see if you agree or have things to add. Maybe we should do ethograms on our animals from time to time so that we know what they do at what part of the day. Mm -hmm. One thing that I have read numerous times that really surprises me is that a dog spends 95% of his waking hours sleeping. <laughs> I don't know how you're supposed to say that. <laughs> well, yeah. um, and uh, that also probably depends on the type of things inside border collies that, that are, if they're working all of the time, they can just work for hours and hours and hours or yeah. uh, um, Australian catalogs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, how long can you, you take a uh, German shepherds were bred to be able to be on duty all day. Yep. I, they'd be herding. And then um, I, the uh, shepherd could wind up going to town and the dogs would stay with the flock, keep the flock out of the things. So they'd be working. They would have times of being more active or less active. And you have livestock guardians. They're on duty all of the time, but it's a different type of duty. They're not hurting. They're it's like pilot listening. duty where broad durations of boredom with yes. occasional spurts of terror. Yes. And they have to be able to go from zero to 60 in a flash. So they've always got some part of their brain on duty for sounds, smells that could be a threat. Yeah, uh, but they may look like they're snoozing in the sun. But I, with when yeah, they're that we far to away it, from jumping up and at them. Yes, to be able to go from zero to sixty, uh, and yeah, so, but a lot of dogs, yes, they're going to be spending a whole lot of their life sleeping. Okay, so an ethogram for your dog. Know your dog. Know what mm -hmm. he does and when he does it. Mm -hmm. look at the effects of stress on that. Mm -hmm. So um, stress can affect anyone many, many different ways, but many of us have a predominant way of showing stress. Oh, an important thing is too, is that good stress, eustress, can be just as hard on your body as distress. That's right. Well, now we get back to the kids running around shrieking with bliss and then suddenly tumbling. Yes. And from there, you have to watch for changes. So you get a baseline mm -hmm. and you watch for changes and you monitor stress. So you're looking for changes that comes from within the dog, but you're also looking for stress because we're all in the business of not showing when we get stressed. And this is really serious for animals. Like a lot of animals, if they look stressed, they're going to get picked out by predators and eaten, mm -hmm. targeted to be eaten. And I have a another friend who we were talking about our dogs having ear flare-up. And both of us noticed that we had significant ear flare-ups after intense tug sessions. What do you mean by an ear flare-up? Itching? Yeah. Yeah, so my dog has had severe problems with ears ever since COVID. And he had a hematoma and we could not get a vet who could treat him at that time. And... So we had just gone to the vet and gotten his ears checked and he had no bacteria, no fungus found in either one of his ears. Went out, did a session with a tug hanging in the tree, right? So he gets to jump up and hang from it and his eyes roll back in his head and he just moans and he's Nirvana for a while. And then we tell him oust and we... Uh, immediately switch him to deep relaxation. So we're working on that high intensity interval training with mm. the um, reduction aspect, so the rehit. And we got it worked out really well, but nonetheless, 
he then went into a significant ear reaction episode. And my friend had had something very similar. We both noticed that it came right after an intense tug session. So okay, that so it was immediate itching. Well, like within 24 hours. Uh, that sounds like it could be a mast cell reaction to me. And that again could be related to uh, possibly the cortisol was being diverted into um, the exercise. And that, that may have caused a bit of a drop. Plus exercise itself at times can trigger mast cell releases. Mast cell issues are something that you didn't hear about even you know, 10 years ago to speak of. Uh, is starting to realize it's much more common. Worst case is mastocytosis, which is almost a cancer. Uh, but mast cell issues, they figured that probably at any one point, there's probably 15% or more of the population that has some degree of mast cell issues that may come and go. And probably 70% of the population at some point in their life will have some sort of a mast cell reaction. Not the yeah. same as an allergy, even though it's can allergies are more like uh, can be more like mast cell reactions, but not all mast cell reactions are allergies. Right. Okay. The problem with mast cells is that when they're triggered a lot, they become trigger happy. Worst case scenario is they start to multiply. And it may take years before they atrophy and die off. Mm. But uh, itchy um, a bit because mast cell uh, it can trigger histamine releases they can wind up creating things where it could be you know, something that's going on where all of the blood vessels in the inner ear it's also right around the nose the whole it, different issues it may almost be something that's coming down through the nasal passages getting towards the eustachian tubes it might be triggering and what they're showing with the itchy ears it might even be something that's starting someplace more like into the sinuses Mm -hmm. But it seems like that could be a mast cell reaction. And mast cell reactions can also trigger a lot of cognitive and um, emotional problems, too. Mm -hmm. uh, everywhere in your body. And they can be nasty little buggers. Yeah. I um, While we're studying for certification and perception modification, we talk about some studies. And one that's always fascinated me has been the fact that people can die of anaphylactic shock in the absence of allergens. Mm -hmm. And so this one study, they took rats, had them swallow a lumen so they could collect mast cells from their stomach and then triggered them with an injection of egg white. And they simultaneously also flashed a light and buzzed a buzzer. They only did this once or twice. Created then, a condition effect. Yeah. Then they did the light and the buzzer, but no egg white. And they had the same mast cell spike. So mm -hmm. there is a learned component to allergies. Yes. And it's so serious that this is why on planes they don't even have packages of peanuts i was mm -hmm. in the uk and a young woman died of anaphylactic shock from kissing her boyfriend who had had a peanut butter sandwich three hours before seeing her yeah uh, i've heard uh, allergies described as a um like a, a post-traumatic effect of the immune system. Interesting way to put it. So, and it can be something that can be learned and it's meant to be a healthy reaction. It's meant to be a defense reaction that when you're exposed to something, your body might be doing things to try to push this crap out of your body. And to, uh, you know, get this stuff out of there with it. So it's meant to be something that's going to be helpful. But it, it's one of the ones that um, it gets triggered to go too far. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't have the counter effects on it. 
So well, the checks and, and balances are out. The effects of um, We're gonna have to wrap autoimmune up problems. Yeah, yes. I mean, there's just so many different kinds. Julie, are we out of time? It's 1020. My time. Okay. To me, it looks like 30. Okay. Well, my phone's telling me 1020. Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. Uh, so, but yeah, so, we'll have to um, wrap up for you. Yeah. So, all of these things, for example, poison ivy. Now, a lot of dogs don't get poison ivy. I don't know if any do, but we get it, or some of us get it. And it's what you call a type four delayed hypersensitivity. And the immune cells actually reside within your body cells. And when you scratch and burst open a cell, the lysosomes escape and cause lots of other cells to deconstruct. And these um, antibodies or, yeah, they're released in your system and it can become systemic and mm -hmm. so there's two takeaways from that never burn poison ivy and that includes no. with one of those weed burners yes it can kill you mm -hmm. and the second thing is uh you need to be really aware that you can suddenly become allergic to something like poison ivy or hornet stings or something like that you know, mm -hmm. past uh, experiences don't dictate what the future will be. All right, so we've got our ethogram and then monitor for changes in, like you mentioned, um, pulse, temperature, activity rates, but also monitor for stress because whether the animal shows it or not, when there are significant changes in life, he is experiencing stress. So you need to release pressure in other mm -hmm. places. And this Checking for for also some things like skin characteristics, a lot of the hypothyroid yeah. the thyroid issues will pop up in skin conditions. Uh so, is keeping their coats. It's not the fact that yes. they grow a thick coat in the winter time it's the fact that they don't let it go mm -hmm. that's more of a danger signal and then once you collect that information bring that with you to your vet or um to your you know research online wh whatever you're gonna do and try to get on it and be an ally to your animal of mm -hmm. course each animal is different and they're definitely different than us, but these things, the biology of, you know, uh, by of living animals is mostly the same. Mm -hmm. So when I say that, that's a, let me just make a fine point of that. A snake operates mostly the same as a human, as a cat, as a dog. However, for example, a cat will be poisoned by things that are not a problem for a dog or a human. The differences, although small, can be very, very important. So mm -hmm. don't make assumptions, but be ready to look for those differences, but also to look for the commonalities. Uh, one thing about dogs as a species, the different breeds and the different types are far more different than any other animal on the planet because of the breeding that we've done. Oh, horses don't I vary. Know. Horses don't vary that much. Mm. Um, I, but you've got uh, uh, hunting dogs, different types of hunting dogs. You've got herding dogs. The dogs that actively herd are so different than a livestock guardian. We have changed the species so much into the individual breeds we need to be able to find out what's kind of typical for the breed. Sometimes it's down to the bloodline. And also then from there, find out what's normal for my dog. And if you've got a mixed breed, like, okay, Rascal looks like he's got a good shot at Terrier. He can be real chilled out, but boy, if he hears an ant fart, 
he's up and he's out the door and he's just wired. Yeah. Um, and he's got that terrier sort of bouncy to bounce. And when he's bored, he's creative. I Then you get other types of dogs and they're going to be, I'm just real laid back. Or you get greyhounds that, boy, they get out and they run. But around the house, they tend to be just real chill. Yeah, exactly. So find out what's normal for the type and then your animal. And it's about time to wind up for you. Yeah, Stand it away. is. Julie, I love talking to you. Every time I learn so much. So, Thank you. So love talking to you too, my dear. And um, so great talking to you again. And you have a rest of your good night with your next learning thing. Thank you. And everybody, thanks for joining us and sharing part of your day with us. And please like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Okay.